Welcome to Hawkett Podcast. Our guest today is Adam Choi, a podcaster, writer, director, and producer. How's it going, Adam? Good. How are you? I'm doing well, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's good to be on the other side of this for, for well, I have before, but, you know, more often than not, I'm the one who's steering and asking the questions and all that, so. Yeah, I'd rather be the one who's, like, being the interviewee and not being interviewed, because I don't like doing that. To be honest, I'm not the person who's getting interviewed. It's, it's like, actually, yeah, it's actually funny because I'm being interviewed later in this week. Also, I'm flipping things around in one of my other podcasts and having a guest interview me. So this is like the warm up for that, maybe. Mm -hmm. So I like to ask my guests starting this question, which is, where are you from? Tell us your origin story. Uh, I'm originally from Long Island, New York. I grew up uh, in two different towns there. I grew up in East Meadow, which is in Nassau County, up until like the end of first grade and then second grade i moved to dix hills our family moved to dix hills in suffolk county um and i lived there all the way through high school and then went to syracuse university for four years moved to la shortly after graduation pretty much a month later i moved uh to uh to la that's 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 the very broad overview yeah i'm from la as well and i'm so ready to move out i i don't like living in the state you live you live in LA right now, I, also. Yeah, I do. I've I've been born and raised in LA. I'm 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 done. But whereabouts? What part of town do you? You don't have to say your your home address or your no, cross street. I'm from but... the Valley, San Fernando Valley. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, can not, you... it's gotten bad over here. Yeah, can you? Since, 26, can... since since 2016, it's just going down the drain. Can you? It's funny. Can you? Can you hear me through through regularly? I'm in Sherman Oaks, so I'm probably not all that that far from you. No, you're not. You're like. To like an hour and a half away. Oh, you're probably like in the West Valley or something. Mm -hmm. I got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's become bad. Like it's, it's just going on nowadays. I don't even like leaving the house. That's how bad it's gotten. Just the the vibe around people is just like. Mm. And I think it's worse probably in the city in like this LA proper than in the valleys. I kind of like the valley. It's a little bit more. It's, I don't it's know. More, well, we could get more, into it. It's more quiet. I'll say that there are a lot more like older people here that live around me. I noticed there are a lot more older, not like our families, but there's nothing really to do here in the Valley. Everything else you have to either go to LA, Hollywood, Anaheim to see like concerts and stuff. They don't have like good venues here, like in the Valley. Everything's like outside of the Valley. Right. I get it. There's a venue out in, uh, I haven't been there, but I know it doesn't Agora Hills have a, decent music venue i forget what it's called agora hills theater or something like that there's one out there somewhere i think i don't think that i know there's one in ventura called i forgot the name of it it's like near the um beach like the, if you the right venue and then there's a pier and then the beach is on the other side of it i forgot the name of it i've been there it's a nice venue see concert cool so now what was your upbringing like for you my up this isn't this is interesting because I, I feel like I can go with this in in so many directions. Well, I'm like, what do I want to say? What do I not want to say? Um, I guess my upbringing, I would call it. I grew up in pretty much like suburban middle class, upper middle class. Um, I had a sister; she was two years older, well, two grades older. Um, I played sports. I was an okay student. I got worse and worse at school as I got older and cared less in a lot of ways. So that's that's part of part of the journey. It's same with me. Same with me. I was good throughout high school. When I came to college, I was like, you know, after community college, I went to a private college, did my um, network administration degree, went back and continued to do my cybersecurity degree. After that, I was like, yeah, I'm done with college. This is a joke. And Dude, I, I got. I was saying. Back, and sorry to interrupt you. I went back no, to the university that I went to and read the reviews. People complain about that university now. It's not good, and I. I already saw like what was going on and how like the staff would treat the students and myself. Like, yeah, I need to just move away and do something else independently on my own. Right. Yeah. No, I think I got worse at school uh, starting after like third grade when it started to get a little bit harder in fourth, fifth, sixth grade and middle school. I was like, this is getting harder. I used to be like a get. I mean, I guess everyone gets straight A's in in first grade and then like kindergarten and stuff like that, but. <laughs> It's all good. Mm -hmm. So what kind of sports did you play? I played, what did I play? I played ba like mostly baseball, I would say, uh, from 
really almost as early I can remember. I guess kindergarten, you start like five, age around five. I think you start T-ball. And then the next year, you're playing regular baseball. But the coaches, the dads are pitching to you. So they're kind of throwing it soft and whatever. And then I think the year after that, that's when the kids start to pitch. And I, you know, I always, I always loved it. I always played. My dad coached little league uh, when we moved to our new town in, uh, in Dix Hills, half hollow Hills, little league was the name of the league. It still exists. I'm sure it's a, it's grown. It's a pretty big league and stuff. Pretty nice fields in the area. I met a lot of friends through that. I mean, that's, that was a big part of my childhood for sure was baseball. Probably too big a part of my childhood in a lot of ways. But looking back, I was pretty well rounded too. Like I got more into music and playing guitar and and instruments and things a little bit later in life. And I've gone through various phases and evolutions of my music fandom and things like that. But my family was always pretty pretty well rounded. My parents were into art, into music, obviously into sports, like I mentioned, and and they uh, they cared about um, education of course, as well, and hmm. and made sure I did what I needed to do to get to the next, whatever it was, grade, college, step in life, so to speak. So you mentioned you went to Syracuse University. What did you, uh, where were you uh, graduated as a degree in? I had a Bachelor of Fine Arts, which is not particularly useful in anything, I would say. I studied uh, film. I was in the visual and performing arts school at Syracuse University. I talk about this quite a lot, how at Syracuse, there's kind of like two different approaches to media, entertainment, the creative arts and, and whatnot, visual arts. Um, it, I, I think it's a little bit different these days. Maybe it's a little bit more integrated, but basically there's two colleges within the university where there's the Newhouse Communication School. I don't know if you're familiar with that. They are kind of like, world renowned or whatever and very well known they have a lot a lot of broadcasters and jur broadcast journalists come out of there and sports announcers and announcers and things like that but also filmmakers and and pe people who work in television stuff but they have more of a, like an industry based approach from what i'd say more about networking and writing resumes and and how to write scripts for pilots and things like that i could be wrong about this but that was kind of the impression i got and what i remember Whereas visual and performing arts school is the art school within the university where I'm in the same classes with a lot of people who are also, uh, especially freshman year with like, they were like painters and sculptors and artists like that. So, and we worked with actual film and film cameras and had to sh send out the film to be developed. And we were, you know, freshman year, we were literally splicing film and together on a movie Ola and a Steenbeck and all these you know, the uh, I don't even remember what you call them at this point. I haven't used it in so long. But those those machines that uh, you splice film and make, you know, films with. Mm -hmm. I'm retarded. So after that, you graduated from college. And how did you get the opportunity to, like, start getting into filmmaking? Well, going back a little bit in high school, I got exposed to taking some like media arts classes, which had actually some video production elements and some film analysis even in there. And photography was part of that. And and I just liked that and got into it. I don't know if I was particularly good at it. I don't I'm still not particularly good at any of these things. And it's always a, a journey and a process um, for for sure. But I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do with my life after high school or what I wanted to study. So it was almost like by default to some degree, it's like, oh, let me see what film, television, media programs exist at colleges in the Northeast. It never was really a thought that I was going to go somewhere far enough where I needed to take a plane there. It, it just didn't seem like there was a reason for it. I'm like, I don't, and also like I remember, I did remember like looking at like USC and UCLA, and those seemed like very uh, hard to get into <laughs> programs and film programs. And even NYU, I did apply for NYU growing up in Long Island in New York, and I went to some like orientation there. And I remember it was like, I just didn't like the vibe, and I didn't feel like I fit in. I remember it like, I felt like I was a bunch of like, hanging out with like a bunch of like Manhattanites and intellectuals and like maybe like rich kids with who are like freaks and like not freaks, but like, 
I don't know, just like artsy, artsy Manhattan types. Mm-hmm. Like, and I didn't feel like I fit in and I knew I wasn't going to get into that program uh, anyway. But by kind of default, I ended up wanting to study film, applied to like a bunch of colleges in the Northeast, got into Syracuse. And I was in like a foundational arts program with a film uh, focus. So freshman year, I ended up did I did take a lot of like studio arts classes, which wasn't really what I did at all. I mean, I had very little background in drawing, paintings, all this stuff, other than maybe an occasional class as a kid that my parents signed me up for, but nothing I rarely stuck with regularly. My I do have painters and other artists and people who are talented in those areas in my family, but I was not one of those people. I'm not crafty. I'm not handy. I'm not like good at studio arts maybe it's more i just don't have the patience for the for those things that's kind of like what i've come to realize is like kids are not not every kid has like add and can't focus kids can focus a lot on what they want to focus on if they Mm -hmm. love playing video games if they love doing xyz they will do it 14 hours a day but like if you give them a boring ass book and put it in front of them or tell them to go paint for 12 hours and they're not interested in those things they're not going to to give their attention to those things as much. So I don't know. Maybe everyone is not as ADD as or ADHD or whatever letters you want to say as as people think they might be. Mm-hmm. So you went to film school. After film school, what did you do after that? After you graduated, got your degree, what kind of um, project did you do, work on or were part of to get uh, exposure in your field? Um, that is a good that is a good question because like. Like many people in this town, it's like definitely a journey and, and in the entertainment, you know, specifically, it's like a journey and people are still trying to find where they can fit, how they can be creative, how you can make a living and have a career in these things. And at Syracuse, I had a like a side job or whatever, and I was working in their media, media, what do you call it? Uh, media library, I guess is what you would call it, where there were books and magazines and DVDs and tapes and things other students could rent out or watch there. And it was a pretty damn easy, fun job. I would just watch movies, work on my own stuff, and occasionally someone would come in, people would rent out things. So I did that, and I was just looking, you know, when I decided to move to LA, I started looking for jobs. This was like literally a month later. Like I, May graduated, June came out here, lived with a roommate, someone I went to college with. Uh, so that helped bring this all together, these plans. But I was looking on Craigslist at different jobs and I came across like media library, tape dubber type person. And um, and I applied for it. And I think I applied on a Wednesday and had an interview a couple of days later and started working on Monday. I remember the guy offered me the job right on the spot. And I remember not expecting him to say that. And I remember how casual it was, which is funny because everything has got so much. In some regards, in some ways, everything has gotten a lot harder since that first job offer. I went into the interview. I overdressed for it, of course, because that's what you do in L.A. Mm -hmm. When you're on a job interview, you overdress, especially in entertainment where you don't need to. It doesn't mean you need to be a slob, but I definitely overdress. That's like a cliche thing to do. But I had it was very casual. It was very conversational, I remember. The guy seemed like a stoner and probably was. I could be wrong, but uh, he was like, oh, well, the job's yours if you want it. I think that's, that might have been his exact words. So I, so that was my first job in Los Angeles is working in the tape library for the TV show Blind Date. I don't know if you happen to remember that show. It was like a reality show. It was like syndicated, I guess is what they call it. And it was basically two people would go on a date, a reality show, and then writers would have thought bubbles above their heads kind of making jokes, making fun of them, articulating the subtext. It actually was pretty entertaining and a good idea for a show and was on along. I'm surprised it's not still on. Maybe it's it's probably on in some capacity or not on in some capacity, but there's probably other content that exists and has been inspired by it over the years. It can be trashy at times for sure. There's definitely a lot of... There are a lot of trashy stuff out there. That people yeah, do. yeah, there was... I remember like I worked in the tape library, so... There was, we would do these, uh, the company would make, um, what do you call it? Like pay-per-view, uncensored pay-per-views because people would do some wild things. So like in some ways I was sort of semi-editing, copying softcore pornography. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of it was what you could be even considered hardcore to be honest with you, but (laughs) it's definitely, uh, 
a uh, very Hollywood, I suppose, in some ways. Mm -hmm. So now, do you have any filmmakers that you looked up to that made you want to go into this line of work? Um, I, well, I mean, I guess some of my, like, it's, a, it's funny because people will, I'll talk to people a lot about, you know, it will come up obviously in LA, especially movies and TV shows, but to be quite frank, and I probably shouldn't even be saying this, like I'm so far behind on everything for the last, like probably decade or more. And I'm not a buff. There's so many classics and great movies and even comedies, which are like some of my favorite films that I just haven't seen. Maybe because maybe I'm the one who has like ADHD and, and is impatient these days and ha not able to always sit down and want to watch I'm, something. I'm the same way. I can't watch anything new anymore. I can't watch TV at all. It just I get distracted. If I put something on, I'm either looking at my phone or looking or just looking at the wall. That's how bad I'm distracted. I yeah, I, I put my phone face down. If I really want to focus on anything, I put my f phone face down without out of reach. Like that's basically what it is but i think it's it's also maybe the content but what i was going to say is that i still love all the great movies that i remember like watching as like a kid and a and a teen like and and into adulthood even like just i mean just thinking about like move mo like i call i think of them as like modern classics like mm -hmm. movies like my cousin Vinny or back to the future or rain man and i know people have like issues or don't love Forrest Gump for various I, reasons. I like Forrest Gump. I thought it was a good movie. Yeah. No, but it's very entertaining. And when it's on, everybody probably watches it and quotes it all the time. And it's such a big part of our culture. But so there's so many modern classics, I would say, really from almost like night I would say like 1975 to like 2000. Those are those are probably the where the greatest movies have been made. I would say in in a lot of ways because it's probably like where filmmakers and Hollywood like we all everyone learned so much skill and technique and and from or whatever it is from all the films that came before it in the twentieth century. But then after it, like everything became probably too woke, too political, too. Uh, what's the word? formulaic in a lot of ways with sequels and remakes. And yeah, yeah I mean, you know, you know, the deal, not that, that I mean, yeah, there's exceptions I, to every rule, but kind of honestly stop watching movies and TV shows. It's just repeated stuff over again from the nineties and eighties that they're redoing either to change the character or put like a political agenda in. And I've noticed that really well with some of these movies that are coming out. Like I'm done with Hollywood. I can't watch any of their stuff anymore. All stuff I watch from like the 70, like 1975 and 2000, like you mentioned, those movies right. But anything else after that, uh-uh. I'll watch the Avengers movies, probably Captain America, and that's probably the only one I'll watch, or Endgame. That's the only two Marvel movies I watch. I mean, there are other ones, but you know, Captain America was my favorite one growing up, and I watch it every time it's usually on TV. But I don't really watch TV anymore, so I don't even know what's on Netflix nowadays either. Like, I've, I've, I don't watch, like, Netflix at all. And if I do, probably for, like, 10 minutes, see what, or just go through what they have, Okay, nothing interesting. <laughs> Turn it off and either go read a book or listen to an audiobook. Yeah, I watched like I did watch like all of Breaking Bad and I watched some of Better Call Saul. And I I could definitely get into series. I'm sure I could get hooked on these things. But what's funny is that like no one really comes up to me and says, Oh, you have to watch this. You have to see this. Oh, you you're gonna love this show. This is awesome. You so like nothing is like that like essential to watch. And and there's just so many choices out there. And there's a lot of high quality content out there. I'm sure. And 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 by the way, it's shot. And even in you know what's the you know the content itself. But there's just so many different choices out there. And and like I said, it's interesting how no one comes up to me. People will make suggestions. People will be like, oh, you might like this. Oh, you might like this. But you know what I might also like to do? 17,000 other things within the only 24 hours we get in a day, and mm -hmm. including working on my own stuff. And I don't know. I, I tend to listen to more uh, podcasts and music like and just YouTubing stuff. Like that's I'm, kinda... I'm literally the same person. I do the same thing. I watch YouTube, listen to podcasts or music. That's the only three things I do nowadays. Or listen to audiobooks if I have the time. I still enjoy going to the movies. And I think also like I do live <laughs> alone. Uh, so something about I think watching movies is more something, a social thing, uh, something you do with, with a romantic partner or a friend or 
or like I said, going to the movies was, I think used, it used to be a big part of how we consume media in this country. But obviously now it's not going to the movies with people. It's watching 10 second videos on TikTok on the toilet by yourself. Exactly. What was the last movie you saw in the theaters? What was the last movie I saw in the theaters? I don't remember the name of it, but it was an independent uh, film by that a friend of mine produced. And it was, I don't, I'm, I'm blank. I'm not remembering exactly this, the story off the top of my head. That's, that's, that's probably on me, but it was basically like a, it was a gay themed film and it was like a love story. And I remember going into it, like being like, Oh, I'm going to go to this to support my friend. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm like, I'm probably not going to like this film very much for two reasons. One, it's not, I'm not really the core audience for, I can appreciate anything Mm -hmm. if it's well done, but I'm like, Oh, I'm probably not the core audience. This is not necessarily my favorite genre, obviously. And, but even more than that, I was expecting it to be very political or woke or, or have like an annoying agenda. That's, but it really wasn't, it really wasn't that it wasn't really that if I, uh, from what I remember. And I remember I, you know, it was, it was decent. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it's hard for me to bad mouth anything like, uh, other than politicians. Mm-hmm. So now, um, do you have any mentors or teacher that you looked up to when you were first starting off in your film career? Um, well, I'll, I'll get to that, but you asked me who are my, my, my favorite fil- filmmaker specifically, and I never, yeah. never answered that. And I know you're not really supposed to say it and leaving his, putting his personal, um, life aside it's hard not for me to met for to not mention woody allen as definitely someone i grew up uh, i shouldn't say grew up watching because i didn't really get into his films until really college honestly i remember they showed us a scene in one of our like film classes where i think it was the scene in annie hall where um the woody allen character and the diane character teen character were talking they were kind of flirting and feeling each other out and drinking, having a wine or whatever on the balcony. But during the scene, the subtext of the scene was written out, like what they were actually thinking below each of them. And I never saw that in a film done before. And it was hilarious. It was funny. I remember thinking it was smart and well done and how just like original that was. And I'm sure nothing is totally original. But after seeing that scene, I'm like, I like this. It's funny because I did watch Deconstructing Harry, I think is that movie. Julia Louise Dreyfus is in that and a ton of other celebrities in that film. And I don't really remember that movie off the top of my head, but I do remember watching it in like middle school, high school with friends. And we're like, what is this? Why are we watching this? I don't get this at all. What is this? It was so different than anything we had watched. And, you know, they're very talky and intellectual films and things like that and about intellectual topics. And adult things, not like sex, well, it is sexual stuff, but like not like, but just adult things, things that adults are interested. And I did watch Deconstructing Harry uh, years later, and I did enjoy it. It wasn't my, it never was my favorite movie, Woody Allen movie. And I don't know that I've watched it more than once or twice, but I would say he was someone, his films were someone that I like really liked a lot of his films. And, you know, there's Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis and, 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 and so many great directors, but also Twilight Zone was something I discovered in in high school and that was definitely a big influence and i still come back to those episodes here i i i watched more twilight zone episodes on youtube in the last few months than i've watched anything new the original twilight zone mm-hmm. season three no I, I don't i forget what season the first three seasons i think are the best ones mm-hmm. so now going back to the question i just asked you about mentors and a teacher that it's right to get into your um career who do you have any one in mind it, yeah, I mean, I I would mention my high school media arts video teacher, Mr. Shoke, was his name. I lost touch with that guy. I should get in touch with that guy. I think I once in a while I try to find him on Facebook or Instagram or something. I should get in touch with that dude. But he was just a nice guy, and I remember him like being maybe one of the one or two only teachers that I genuinely liked or had some sort of influence on me or, or I thought were good. Maybe that was the word. Most teachers I had were terrible and uninterested looking back. And I understand it and I get it, but not, I, maybe, I'm be, maybe I'm being harsh and, and just, or, or whatever. But I, he, he, was, he was a good dude. And I remember like, you know, I would, I would do stuff. I've, I like filmed stuff at like homecoming and did some stuff related to the school for film. And 
we actually had like an early editing avid system this is like 1990 something late 90s so like that was we were kind of like i guess taxes did get you something in our in our community but he i would say he he was uh like an early mentor but i didn't think of him as a mentor but a cool teacher i guess Mm -hmm. so now tell us about your short film called the edited what is it about and how did you get the idea of of creating this short film oh man there's so much backstory (laughs) to, to, to that i guess um well the film was produced by an organization that no longer exists called Talies and Nexus. Um, they were a liberty minded um, nonprofit and they would help cultivate artists, creators and bring them together and give them mentorships and, and offer fellowships that you could apply for. So I went through few of their programs and seminars and things applied for their filmmaking labs and didn't get in and eventually got in and had some projects that or had project that didn't get you know greenlit and and whatnot and so there's there's all these bumps in in the road and then i came back to them with a project that i applied with to write it and direct it at first i almost only applied for like the writing side again it comes back to like the finding who you are. What am I? Am I a writer? Am I a director? I did this, this thing, but I don't feel like I'm a director, but I kind of want to try it. But like everyone wants to be a director. So it's like, but I'm like, okay, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's go on this track. So uh, I applied with this project and I had developing uh, an idea for a, like a series. It was basically a idea for a girl who went who was uh in high school and she was homeschooled and then she goes to a high school where everyone is essentially zombies in the public school like they're actual zombies so it's that was like sort of the original idea and then in the development process with this Talies and nexus program i don't even remember exactly how we got from point a to b to c to d but it came to be where it was a girl in a school and essentially they edit all the content in in the school to you know support the powers that be at the expense of truth and actual education which which makes sense cuz they're like in a sense they are all kind of like zombified but it, it definitely it, and and all, it went I remember one part of the development process we were kicking around an idea where she's like selling original copies of books digitally or otherwise that are you know the the original ones and she's like selling these books like if they're drugs on the black market there's a chris rock joke uh about that i remember like talking about the first drug dealers were selling books i i think he says how like i got i got i got a word i got a i got i got a sentence it's ten dollars or whatever like i got a whole i got a paragraph here like so that was that was one part of the the evolution. What you what did you ask me originally? So, what, how did you come up with the idea of the movie? And yeah, that was it. Oh yeah, I think that was pretty much it. It was it was where I mean a lot of give and give and take between the because they were funding it and 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 I valued everybody's opinions and and I would consider them all mentors actually. Like I could talk about some of my some of the mentors from from that program, but. It, it it's a development process and it's, it's good to go through that process and, and get the opinions of intelligent people because they'll poke and prod in your story and ask you all the right questions and, and, and whatnot. And, it, and it, and I think it worked out in the end because the script I wrote is pretty much word for word, the script that was shot. So that's a sign that, you know, I think everyone was happy with, with where the story ended up. Mm-hmm. So what is the message behind this uh, short film? What is the message behind the short film? I mean, I suppose it's a cautionary tale. <laughs> it's where we're headed. Like you say, it's a documentary. A lot of the comments, I think, are on the uh, on the YouTube. And then I've gotten are like, oh, we're already here. Or is this a documentary? Like you're saying, like, so I would say it's like, if we don't do X, Y, Z, this is going to be the future for X, Y, Z, you know, for us. Mm-hmm. So now walk us through the development I, of the film, like 
from like production. I know you already talked about kind of the writing process and the writing process, everything that went on to like actually get this film out to the public and on YouTube. Oh, oh, like the uh, just the, the chronology of all the, of like where how how a film gets from development writing <laughs> yeah. to yeah. YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, well, like I said, it helped immensely so much, and I'm and I wish I had that at the snap of a finger to have all that support, you know, inter- the intellectual support and, 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 and that, and that help, but also of course the money and access to, to resources was, was super helpful. Um, I think ultimately the, it cost 15 grand to make the project, which is, I guess, not a huge amount of money, but it's still a lot of money. Um, so that's, that's, that's a, that's a big thing. Um, I I I landed a, a a DP director of photography who's who was this was the first big I should say that this is the biggest project that I had ever directed up to this point and still have up to this point in terms of scale and budget and amount of crew and and resources involved and and whatnot and it was only a two day shoot but it was such a valuable amazing experience. That I feel, I really feel like I can direct anything at this point. I'm not saying I'm going to know. And there's also different kinds of directors. Also, there's there's obviously some directors are super smart and talented and fucking know everything about every camera, every shot, every scene. Every they just have a wealth of knowledge of all areas. But there, I think there's something to be said for some uh, directors who are willing to lean on the talent and performers and the skills of the people on the project. And that's kind of what I what I learned uh, a lot. Like, I don't know if you have a decent script and you have good people around you in front of the camera and behind the camera, your job is, is you don't really need to worry that much about like, Oh, this shot needs to be perfect and blah, blah. Like I, I have input on that, but you, you're leaning a lot on the DP. And then you got the producer screaming at you to like, hurry up. So it's like, I can't focus on that. My job is kind of just like, make sure to shoot the script and, get everything done that needs to be done and keep everyone happy. Like, I feel like that's the big thing is like communic communication. That's like the biggest thing is communicating with the actors on, you know, on set, off set, make sure everyone has the information. Obviously that falls a, a lot on other people coordinating and, you know, working on the production itself. But I think that's really the big thing is like setting the tone leadership, uh, putting out a spread of veggies and ranch dip when the actors come over to rehearse kind of thing and work on their lines and discuss the things. Um, what the hell did you ask me? So I was asking you, how did the, the Oh writing, yeah. The chronology, yeah, you know, chronology of like the pro- writing process film. So at the time you filmed it and then everything in between that and then final product that got released to the public. Right. Well, it helped to have the program and also helped to, to get connected with the uh, John Cocom was the it was the main producer and he's was like amazing <laughs> basically he helped me land the location and and uh, I mean all kinds of things and solve all kinds of problems and 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 you know I had a decent network and between my network and his network and my friends and people I met over the years I was able to you know we were able to fire hire, not fire but hire people you know, that we liked and bring on people that we liked and, and cast people that we liked. So, you know, it all worked out in, in that sense. So we found the locations, found the crew and cast, you know, rehearsed, did some location scouting, filmed two day, only a two day shoot, uh, filmed, uh, the post-production process was, was long, you know, editing and doing, doing all that stuff. That I mean, the editor did a great job. She's uh, Sasha, Sasha Patsenka. I haven't looked at these names in a, in a in a long time. I hope I'm saying her name right. But like very like very intuitive. Like I remember the first cut, like seeing the first cut that she put together because we just sent her footage and the script and said do your thing. I didn't even really look at much of the footage, like when it came in. But uh, yeah, she just put it together, and I was like, damn, I probably couldn't have come up with a better. Like it made sense, like a lot of the timing and and just the initial cuts she put together, and then from there, you know, the music <laughs> the music was a process too. What's funny about this, and 
kind of funny about my weird life is that I love comedy. I love stand up comedy. I've produced shows over the years. I'm not a stand up comedian. Some of my favorite movies are comedies too and shows. I was, I didn't even mention, but I used to really love SNL like in the 90s. Like, because we were in like a real golden era in a lot of ways. Because when me and friends kind of started getting into it more, it was like Will Ferrell and, and like the mid late 90s cast and crew, which were Norm McDonald, like pretty good stuff. But also at the same time on Comedy Central, they were already airing reruns of David Spade and, and, uh, and, and Adam Sandler and all this, Chris Farley, or like that era. So we were getting into that one. And even I would, you know, I, because I love these ears, I guess I was like, well, I already loved Eddie Murphy mm-hmm. and, and his movies and just thought he was hilarious and super talented even earlier. But I remember going back into dipping into some of the 80s uh, SNL and then you come across even the John Belushi stuff. So I, so I did love uh, all of that stuff. But what I was saying is that I love comedy and I've written some screenplays that haven't seen the light of day that were more comedies, but Often what I do write tends to be more drama or sci-fi or dystopian, even if I'm intending to do a comedy. Because with this project, the edit, I did think it was going to be more of a satire. And I still kind of call it a satire, but I thought it would be more in the tone of like an idiocracy. That's like what I had in mind. And I had that in mind for the tone, the dialogue even, the and the music and the, the sound. But when I shot the movie and started working with the composer Risto who's a friend of mine Risto Mietnin Finnish guy um we kind of were working with each other and going back and forth and getting feedback from you know the Tally S and Nexus program and the movie just did not want to be idiocracy it wanted to be more of a black mirror episode so eventually we we rejiggered the the soundtrack to be more of a tone that fit more of the sci-fi drama, which it is than the comedic satirical film that I perhaps intended it to be. Mm -hmm. So now how would you describe your directoral style? My director is, I mean, I've, I've only really direct, this is the biggest project I've ever, you know, directed with it on a, you know, full set, so to speak. But what would be my, my style is really, it's it's funny because I did hear Woody Allen kind of echo this in some interviews uh, over the over the years. Is that really I just kind of lean on everyone else, and maybe that's part of me being forthright about my lack of experience, especially at the time when shooting this. But I don't think I would really change anything. Honestly, that different. I would really want to hire um, another DP. Colin O was the name of the DP who shot the edited, but someone as talented and cool as him and great to work with. It sounds good to me. Like just really my style is leaning on everyone. My style is hiring good people that I like and knowing that they are good at their job beforehand. Um, uh, and just letting, letting everyone do their job and making sure people have what they need. That's, that's kind of it. Like I, it's not about, I mean, there, I, I focused more on performances, I would say. Than, than the than how the shot looks or uh some of the more technical aspects of film. I'm not gonna be like, hey, we maybe if we use this lens, we could do blah 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 blah. I don't fucking know shit about any of that. But I know like that girl needs to be louder when she's saying that line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so now as a filmmaker, what's your thoughts on AI? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I mean I guess I understand some of the fears with AI, but I haven't ha- had any issues at all with AI. I argue with a friend of mine about this, and I tell him how helpful it's been, how helpful ChatGPT has been with my writing. I don't see it as someone that's writing for me. I see it as a writing partner who I can work with. It, it's still not gonna, it's still not there where it can create. I think something that has the emotional resonance that a human has, and even if you. It takes knowing something is created by AI. And even if you look at two, if you look at two works of art or something that are very similar and one's created by AI and one is not, this is, I'm not explaining this, this point well, but basically just the fact when you know something is AI, it makes it less appealing. 
like the example I give, maybe this is not the best example, but Billy Joel, who's one of my favorite musicians of all time, Long Island guy, of course, he hasn't put out any original music, popular music with lyrics since 1993 or 1994 until recently where he put out a new song, a new original song. He's been playing it live called Turn the Lights Back On. And I like the song. I do enjoy the song. It's not my favorite Billy Joel song, but it was moving. I probably cried the first time I listened to it because it is kind of an emotional ballad about this guy who hasn't put out music for a while and is putting it, putting music out now. So it is dem- definitely at the very least semi-autobiographical. But then I found out that he had like three other writers on it. Mm. So I was like, it kind of changes things for me. Like makes me feel like, oh, you weren't super as passionate or into this. Where and and as someone who used to write all pretty much all his material, so it's like I'm not going to enjoy the Billy Joel AI song as much as I would an original song that's written by him. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like, uh, do I see AI as a good thing or a bad thing? I I mean, I think it's if, like I said for me, I think it's been a good thing, helpful for me. I'm trying to use it to get jobs. I'm not using it to, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to use it to help me find jobs. I'm not worried as much worried about it, uh, stealing my job. I mean, I guess there's some questions about intellectual property and things related to it. I know that there was that George Carlin AI special that came out and then like the, the, uh, his, uh, what do you call it? His estate like sued the AI company. So there's, there's some gray areas, but, I'm not really that afraid of AI yet, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So now, do you have any advice for aspiring filmmakers that you want to like preach to them? Do I have any advice for aspiring filmmakers? Mm -hmm. Um, Or someone that's getting like started, like getting their foot into this field. I would just say make some shit. And that's what every, that's what a lot of filmmakers are doing just because you can on your phone, like all these these young whippersnappers, they're way better editors than, than me. They're better sim- cinematographers with their phones than, than I am. So if you can make stuff, just go out there and do it. And if you could do it on a low budget, just do it. And I would also say keep writing. I mean, that's kind of what I tell myself. Keep writing. If you want to direct something, what better way to be able to do it than to have something to direct that's your own, you know? that's So I, that's, I would say make stuff if you can and just probably always be writing. Mm -hmm. So now when the movie came out, when your short film came out, how did you approach of handling positive and negative criticism from peers and critics? Uh, How do I handle positive and negative? How did you handle it? Yeah. Well, I'm lucky and, and have a lot of gratitude because there hasn't been that much negative, negative criticism. It's almost like either people see the film and they like it or just, they just don't, they just don't, uh, know about it what what is interesting to me is that i have noticed on some of the youtube comments or maybe one or two or three or something people do kind of interpret the film in their own way like it really and i i mean it like in both sides of the political spectrum like uh, someone on the left wing will watch this and be like oh this is a good film because all these crazy right wingers are trying to control what we have access to in our schools as far as curriculum and then like a right winger or sense more center or libertarian or you know the same people will say the same thing be like oh my, this is a cool film like it's totally all about how the left wing is trying to control whatever, blah, 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 blah. I suppose both sides make a point, but obviously you can gather where I, where I stand. But in terms of criticism, there hasn't been much. I don't know. I I think about like, you know, if I'm able to, because I want to develop this into a, a bigger series and have it get more eyeballs and, and bigger audience. And I know once you, because I follow a lot of people who have bigger followings and are filmmakers and just like negative feedback and, and assholes and trolls. It all is part of the experience of like having some amount of success. So if you have haters, it means you're getting attention. It means you have success. And I feel like with anything, you can only let it, you shouldn't let it hurt you and affect you emotionally at all. But if you are going to be bothered by something that's relatively, unimportant in the grand scheme of things don't let it consume you i could see, read something and be like oh that hurt my feelings that was mean i'm sad about that but like 
for le- that's literally like three seconds that I feel that inside me, and then I'm moving on. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. With I follow this artist. He gets like hated on every single day. People don't like him because he talks. He's a musician. He talks about like what's going on in like entertainment industry and like politics and stuff. And just his like his being vocal. A lot of people, a lot of people like the pronoun people don't like him at all because he's like speaking out against them and saying the truth about them. So like hurting their feelings. So it's kind of funny to me seeing that. It's like, yeah, we need more artists and musicians to like speak about all the BS that's been going around for the last few years. Sure, I yeah. Honestly, I honestly think half of these artists just jump on the bandwagon of what's going on and honestly don't really care deep down in their heart. Yeah, I don't know if I consider that not someone like that being an artist. I've sort of once in a while I'll look at what is the definition of artist or think about what is the goal or what what should be the what is the job of an artist? What is the job of a comedian? Mm-hmm. And 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 if you're like spouting out the talking points of the regime or representing them, you're not being an artist and you're not representing people. You're a tool mm-hmm. in more ways than one. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So now are you working on any new projects or any new, are you going to be doing any new short films in the future? I don't have anything going into production imminently, but I am de- working on developing the edit into a longer form series taking place in a bigger world. And that's like been a big focus of mine. <laughs> well, like Especially- something like, so, so something like how Netflix does, they have like, like seasons based episodes, like season one, eight ep- episodes. Exact- how- exactly. I've, I mean, exactly. I'll tell you, I mean, I've been writing and rewriting, but I'm, I mean, my plan, I really, I mean, someone watching this could give me advice and I'm always open to advice, but really what I'm thinking is I want to write the first three episodes and I've written two and I'm rewriting the episode three right now, kind of outline the rest of the first season, which is probably another five, let's say 10 episodes, whatever it is. And then broadly have some ideas and where the story arcs and character arcs might go for seasons two, three, four, and organize all this into a some sort of pitch presentation, whether digital or print or whatever it is, that gives people an idea of what the series looks like, what it's about. Obviously, the short as well is a proof of concept that carries hopefully some amount of weight, maybe more weight than I'm even giving it credit for. Um and then just really organize all my pitch materials. And um, there, there's, I guess the way I think about it, there's four things I need to get. And if I can get one or two of them, I feel like I could find the other things. So that would be like a platform. Where is this going to be ultimately? Where is it going to premiere ultimately? Um, actors. It's good to have actors. That helps, mm-hmm. especially ones that are a name, if I can do that. Uh, producer, someone who can actually help me like, with the nuts and bolts and logistics and getting the goddamn thing off the ground uh, and money. That's probably the most important thing is, is finding who can fund this and, and where can I find the money for it. And so that's kind of like where I'm focusing, trying to like juggle these different things by outreaching, to, you know, doing outreach to, to people in, in various, you know, areas related to film and continuing to write. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like, when I write, I mean, this, this is not logical at all. And I, and I understand that I need to be proactive at other things related to filmmaking to get projects made besides write. But sometimes I feel like it helps my karma. Mm-hmm. Like the universe will sometimes know, like, dude, I'm not going to help you meet some producer if you haven't written, worked on your script for three days. You're not doing, you're not, you know. But then when I get inspired and I'm, and I bust out a page or two and, and I'm like, oh, I'm up to page 16. And I used to be on page 12 two days ago. Look at that. I'm, I'm not I'm not a new place now. I'm like, oh, maybe the universe is going to like be nice to me. And I don't know. I don't always think in those terms, but I think I think things that the universe knows. Mm-hmm. So now being a filmmaker, I know you are also a podcaster. Tell us about the two podcasts that you host. I know you host one and you co-host the other with two other people. No, I don't. I I host uh, both of them. Okay. Um, my my mistake. That's <laughs> all. It's all. Well, I have guests. I have guests. Yeah, I know on. you have guests. I've seen the other show, which I'm not going to pronounce because I was like, I'm not going to see the second. T- Tedeschi. Tedeschi. Yeah, Trucks I was going to pronounce it. I was going to yeah. mess it up. Everyone. Well, everyone always says Tedeschi, 
and I was that's gonna not... say something similar or I was gonna yeah. it. I was like, I'm just gonna let the host the guest say it. I've it's... seen yeah, people who've been Susan Tedes Tedeschi is the is the lead singer guitar player in the Tedeschi Trucks band. But yeah, people have introduced her who are in the music industry, who are famous musicians. They've said Tedeschi publicly. So I don't think she is super offended. But my two podcasts are People We Love and the Tedeschi Trucks podcast. The People We Love podcast um, is basically, I, that was the first one I started doing. And basically, I interview people from all walks of life, most often comedians and other entertainment types, creative types, but not exclusively. I've talked to family members and ex-cons and entrepreneurs all po political activists uh pol even politicians athletes like all kinds of people and that's something i do like about this podcast where i can really have anyone on as a guest and basically what i do is i ask them to talk about a casual conversation about their life and career and ask them to talk about who inspired them at first i was like i'm gonna do a podcast where this person's gonna come on and talk about this one other person and that's gonna be the show but it really ended up becoming more or less a casual conversation. That's, that was, that's what I was going to do also. It's like, nah, -uh. I'm just going to do like how, how you did like talk about the other topics like occupations and interests and life stories. That's mostly what I focus on my show as well. Bring different people on from musicians and all stars. It doesn't really matter to me. I like enjoy what I do. But I do something similar. I do a, a lot of, alike to what your show, uh, show is. Right. I feel like. And so it kind of evolved into like, oh, just I, I kind of just like to make sure they talk about people and then I'll just kind of like frame it. So and so loves their mom, Barbara, so and so loves comedian Dave Chappelle, even if they don't talk about Dave Chappelle for an hour straight. And there's only a few minutes with them, you know, speaking passionately about him. I'll kind of frame the episode in, in those terms rather than saying and I've and this is something I'm toying with, you know, over the years. I'll think about like rebranding. Oh, maybe I should just be the Adam Choit show and just bring random people on and not really have this like people we love hooked to it. So but I but what keeps me going with that podcast is that all the conversations I have are really rewarding and uh inspirational and I learn a lot. And perhaps more than anything, this is something I kind of invented a term that like how I think of it, it's kind of a friendship hack mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Cause not That's all right. of my, I've had some past correspondence or even friendships or relationships with people that have come on the show. But for the most part, it's like just someone I met recently, I saw at a comedy club or I figured I'd reach out to online or I saw something they did that I liked or they were recommended by a friend or I just know them from Twitter, from political circles. So I speak to these people and then like, an hour later, we've shared laughs and had this casual conversation where we're forgetting a camera's even on and they're telling me some personal things or whatever. So it's like, by the end, it's like, I think we're friends now. That's which everything is cool you too. just said is literally how I do my show and how I got to know so many people from so many different industries. Everything you just mentioned is how I, like, that's my true, that's how my show is. And that's my focus to like, Bring people, like I already said, bring people on, share their stories, and then make friends with them later on. Yeah, this is going to sound like an insult, but, I, but I'm going to say that it's cool that you're kind of an idiot like me who's not super, like, uh, demoralized by perhaps not having audiences as with the sizes that we'd like to. But because deep down, we know that these conversations are worth it and we're getting something out of it. There's so many times, and even like... I mean, even like right now, like I woke up, I'm like a little under the weather, not feeling great, but like just having this conversation and just like talking to another human being is kind of like uplifting and uh, spiritually fulfilling perhaps in some ways. So that does, that does keep me going. And I, and I feel bad maybe for myself that I haven't been able to like put out episodes regularly as much as I'd like to. At first, I'm like, I want to do this once a week. I'm going to put this episode, blah, blah, blah. But like, I need to like refocus my priorities. And that's something I've learned a lot. Like uh, no one's going to think that I'm a failure and an asshole if I don't put out an episode of people we love every week. And maybe that's what hurts the most is that people are not clamoring for it as much as they'd like to. But it's still important, I think, for me to continue to do it, even if it I can't put out episodes or don't put out episodes as much as I want. So I've been trying to like refocus some things with the comedy shows and the podcasts and the writing and the filmmaking and my day job and other endeavors and 
and other th- commitments and things going on in life. It's like I said, like if we had 35 hours in a day and lived to be 130, yeah, I'd fucking watch every show someone recommends for me and see watch every movie from start to finish. But like it's only so many hours uh, in a day. Mm-hmm. So now from all the episodes you have done from People We Love podcast, who has been your favorite guest or story that the guest has shared with you that you like, like not attached to, but like thought about after the show episode was over with them? Oh, that's such a good question and a hard question. I almost want to like pull up the list of guests because it's it's almost like just some rant. It's real. I'm going to give you a bad. I might give you a bad answer. I, almost, I think I am going to pull up the guest. But I guess what immediately jumps out at me about is the conversations I've had with family members. The very first episode of People We Love was, was with my 98-year-old grandmother at the time. Was she 98 or 99? So like. That's just special to me. I don't know. It's it's hard to it's hard to like top that. But really any people that have gone through like hardship in their life, like uh that's that's always inspiring to see people come out the end the other end of anything. Even if it's just like, oh, I lost a lot of weight. But I, you know, talk to people who are in jail, people who are addicts, people who, who lost family members and were or bunch of people I've had on who had cancer and or tumors and like just like all these types of stories like it's gotten sometimes more emotional than I thought it might be because I just don't you just don't know what people are going to say so there's been there's been some stories like that do you do you follow uh do you know Mark Claire or Lines of Liberty you haven't heard of him he he was I a know. guest on and I remember he told this story about how I don't remember the details of it but he did some high school prank senior year with so many kids in his school. And then like the, uh, they got in trouble, but it was kind of way over the top. The punishment It was just kids being kids. And I remember he was talking about how his dad really stood up for him against the school and how that meant a lot to him. So just like random things like that, like stick out at me, I guess. Mm -hmm. So now tell us about the comedy producing job you have. Oh, it's not a job. I'll talk. I, I I didn't talk about Tedeschi Trucks podcast. Oh, go also. ahead. Go ahead. Or which? Okay, what? Where ahead. do you want? What, what do you want to talk about Let's first? Talk about the second podcast, and then we'll go to the. Your... I f- I figured we'll keep. A, there's a method to the madness here. Um, the Tedeschi Trucks podcast. Well, basically, I, I mean, where does that? Eat? Where do I even begin with that? I well, going way back, I played trumpet in middle school or whatever and then i stopped playing in high school i guess i just didn't get into it as much i never was in jazz band i should have joined jazz band i I enjoyed the instrument i was pretty good at it i was first trumpet i you know for most of the time playing and i enjoyed i enjoyed practicing i enjoyed playing the things i was good at or playing whatever i liked it was just like stupid disney songs like oh look at me i'm playing this but i'm like why would i want to go to after school band like, I don't want to do that. I want to go play sports or do watch fucking TV. I don't know. So I regret, I guess, not trying jazz band because I because you play, I guess you play more popular music and rock and things like that. Not just like jazz. What jazz band is just like playing playing fun music that people like. There's like guitars in there and other instruments bring into the fold. Um, but then freshman and I got more into the media arts stuff like I talked about. But freshman year at college. I, uh, cause I, I was always into like the Billy Joel and got more into Beatles and Rolling Stones and Zeppelin and stuff when everyone was l- listening to Eminem and Tupac and Biggie or some p- p- pop punk or whatever emo stuff, whatever the people in the South cafeteria listened to the people in the South cafeteria at high school, they were the one, the skaters who were into the, the punk stuff and the alternative stuff. And then on the other side, that was like all the people who are into rap white and black just with the people who were into the rap stuff and i got into both of those things later and do have an appreciation for both of those genres as well and lots of different kinds of music but i always like kind of classic rock and got more into that stuff in college and blues as well so but in college like you know you knock on the door two doors down every you know there's some there's at least three people on your floor who have a guitar or bass guitar or something that you can fiddle around with and eventually that got me into guitar and then i started exploring slide guitar you know what slide guitar is you put it's like a little you put like a little like uh, medicine bottle on your finger and slide it up and down the neck and it makes like a vocal quality 
to the sound of the guitar. And I started to explore that a little bit. And I was talking to my dad and he's like, uh, you might want to check out this guitar player, Derek trucks. And I knew the name and I knew, uh, that I think he, I knew that he played with the Allman brothers band and I knew their hit songs. Uh, but I never really did a deep dive on the Allman brothers or their music. Um, but then I started to listen to Derek trucks a little bit and I ended up seeing him live in the end of 2010 with his band. Uh, I think it was Tedeschi trucks band at this point, but I really enjoyed that show. And I went to another show next year and started probably YouTubing them and getting more into their music. So between like 2010 and like 20, well, really the present every year, I've just been getting more and more into them to the point where in 2020, I'm like, I want to start a podcast about them. And I, and I did kind of pitch it to a few podcast networks who ultimately passed on it, which is fine. But I guess maybe something to do, maybe between the lockdowns and just like really wanting to do this and, and it not working out with these other companies. I'm like, I'm just going to start this thing myself and just talk about all things related to Tedeschi Trucks Band, this 12-piece blues rock soul powerhouse fronted by Derek Trucks, a virtuoso slide guitar player and guitar player. He's the band leader. Susan Tedeschi is his wife. She's the lead singer and plays guitar too and, and does, plays some lead guitar also and does get solos, but they have a harmony section with three vocalists, uh horn section with a sax trombone and uh trumpet uh, bass. They have two drummers like the Allman brothers. And I think grateful dead had for most of their runs in, in that sort of tradition. So it's a real rock and roll blues, soul funk uh, show that they put together. And I just got more and more into them over the years and just, was already having conversations online, offline all the time about them. So again, like a lot of podcasts, it's like, why don't we just, we're already talking about this stuff all the time. I'm already totally engaged in, into this world. Might as well share content related to it. So you're a super fan of that band. Yeah. Then that's a word I use. I, I sometimes use that word too, to describe others. I would definitely say I'm a super fan. I've seen them over 30 almost up into the 40s times live at this point wow. and i would probably be more if i didn't live on the west coast who gets the short end of the stick as far as touring because there's just more there's <laughs> less cities that are further apart and it costs that's more annoying. money to, to get everyone out here that's so I, that's not a thing it's so annoying i hate when it's, bands don't come to la and they go to like florida a lot or like texas like people in florida are lucky you get to like either fly or drive to the nearest like popular like city and get to see the band like four times atlantic coast is a good place to live if you're into music other than maybe some west coast but even west coast based bands probably don't spend mm-hmm. as much time uh, out here I the don't bands know. i listen to they do perform but it depends on what venue or like like but not venue but like local area they're performing in if the venue's not great i'm not gonna go see them they live here but they don't perform here yeah, <laughs> not when or other than like it depends on the size of the the act obviously who who's doing a world tour versus who's you know doing local local shows like that but yeah i'm just crazy about i could talk up this this and the entire this entire podcast about the band if you want to that's perfectly fine with me i'm happy to do that no nah, no nah. so let's talk about the comedy pod, uh, uh, producer job well not job but what is it tell us about that Oh, how did I get into all that? Yeah, yeah. That's that's a, that's an interesting journey. It's and it's definitely something I don't want to close the the door on. And really beyond comedy, just like I really enjoy producing events, and and would like to do some more stuff, produce some comedy events, music events, speaking events, fucking poetry. I don't give a shit. I I just think events are fun and and it's cool to bring people together in in real life. One of my favorite things is like maybe favorite things isn't the right word. But when I'm at like a comedy show or a concert, really of any size and scope, I do kind of enjoy watching people run around frantically doing shit, like making things happen. It's up, there's something soothing. Soothing is not the right word, but there's something satisfying about me. Just like, I don't know, it's, it's exciting, but it's also I have a deep respect for how hard people are working on a production because there's just like, so many uh moving parts that it really does take teamwork but basically i started i've always loved comedy i've gone to you know a lot of stand up shows or a handful over the years um not as many in la 
for my first decade. I, I mean, I still went to some shows. I'd go to like big shows. People would invite me to shows, but it wasn't like a big part of my social life or or regular. It wasn't like as regular as something I did. It was something I always loved, but not something I did regularly. And then I started going to this like open mic at uh, the Cork Corkies, which is like down the street from me, which no longer is open. The structure is still there, but they did this Tuesday open mic and uh i went a few times and i had a friend who would uh my friend michael sang and played ukulele and then i play guitar a little bit so i uh played a little with him and i did some poetry there but it was one of those open mics where you could do anything you could do stand up you could uh do music you could i think you could rap to a fucking backing track you're playing i think you could really do anything there i think they had they allowed that too really whatever you wanted to do. But I connected with a fair amount of comedians there at at the mic. And a lot of them would produce or be on other shows and invite me to shows. I start following them on social media. So I got connected to a lot of the like independent comedy scene, I feel like, um, and found a lot of small shows, uh, indie produced shows and backyards and garages and alleys and living rooms and rooftop, like really all these off the beaten path more off the beaten path type shows. And I found I enjoyed those more than going to a comedy club, which obviously costs more. Um, you have drink and food minimums there, parking. It's more of a, obviously you're seeing the top, top comedians in town and, and that's cool too. But I was finding, I could find, see a lot of those comedians often at these other shows that were free, cheap, back rent backyard shows and there was also more of a social aspect to that as well whereas like a comedy club a lot of the time oh it's the show's over everyone's gonna leave now or you don't have the access necessarily in the same way but it's, it's not always that way but there's something different about a private event or something that's a little bit more unique than just going to a comedy club where they're shuffling people in and shuffling people out to some degree so i remember new year's was coming up this was 2019 and I was talking to some friends outside. I think it was outside the cork and we're like, Oh, you, they're like, you should produce a show at your house. I'm like, my apartment, my apartment is not big enough for a show. I can't do it at my apartment. What are you talking about? So then they, they this dude uh, came over, Michael Monsoor, and he, he was kind of like scoping out the scene. Like, he's like, Oh, we could definitely do it here. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I think so. Um, and he's like, when do you want to do this? I'm like, hmm, what are you doing New Year's? He's like, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything. So we put on a New Year's comedy show. I handled more of like this, a lot of this. I mean, we did it together. He did. He, I mean, he knew what to do as far as decorating, creating atmosphere and some of the nuts and bolts. He booked all the comedians. So that was my first experience, like booking my own show or producing my own show. It was an apart, private apartment show on New Year's Eve. And it was really fun. And it went, it went great. And then I did, what did I do? I think I did, did I produce my next show? I think I did the next one by myself. I'm like, I learned how to do this. So let me do like a birthday show. That, that it, it, was, it was definitely a different experience not having this, the support in the same way. And like the turnout wasn't quite what it was on New Year's, but it was still a fun show and the comedians were great. And like, that's crazy that I booked all those really good comedians for, for like, just my own small little birthday show. That was cool. But, um, and then obviously lockdowns and 2020 all happened. And I started to do, uh, when was, oh yeah, this was 2020. So I was, I think I was planning to do another show in March. Just like, oh, I'm going to just do another show. No, no special occasion. It's going to keep going. Maybe I can do this monthly. So then I canceled that show, of course, because the world kind of stopped. Mm. And, uh, I kind of hadn't thought about it for a while. And then in, I think I, it probably wasn't even until the next year where, well, there's more to the story. <laughs> because as you know, lockdowns happened. So there was not comedy shows happening a lot in 2020 or 2021. And there were mm -hmm. less of them. And then there was mandates and mass culture. And mm -hmm. obviously politics was seeping in more and more to people's acts and i did not agree with a lot of it and 
but I still wanted to go to shows. So I would, you know, stand off to the side, not wear my mask or just keep bite my tongue. If a comedian would say something I didn't like on stage or I did disagree with their politics. Like I don't have to agree with everything you say, but it was, it was, it did become a little bit annoying. And, uh, so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do another show. <laughs> I'm going to do another show. I'm going to book all the comedians who I know are going to be cool being in a place with where everyone's not wearing a mask and there are no mandates and whatever. So this was this was in 2021, I think. So I did I did a couple of like shows like that where I booked all the comedians and knew that they would be cool with the vibe and, and atmosphere that I wanted to create. So I think I did what I do, like a holiday vibe show. I did like a, I think I did like one or two of those. And then a friend I, uh, was working at a bar in, uh, it actually was the Elks Lodge in Pasadena, but the black version of the Elks Lodge. I don't know if you're familiar with these fraternal organizations, the no, Elks or anything. No, Remember no. like Homer Simpson was like a wood, the Illuminati people. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no, one of the, one of the, like those lodges, okay, you know, okay. they, they do philanthropy and they host events at their venues, but you know, they had a bar and a venue and we were able to reach some kind of agreement where I put on some shows. So I did a bunch of shows there. That was fun. That's been fun over the years. Um, I'm still open to possibly doing more shows there. We'll see where that goes. And then, uh, then I got, then I want, I just decided I want to reach out to other venues and possibilities. And I know pineapple Hill saloon down the street from me, they were very, uh, Angela Marsden. She's like a hero of mine, to be honest with you. Like, she really fights back against the government authorities stands up for her bar and her business and all the bullshit. And, and she's seen it all been through it all, like just owning a bar in Los Angeles. You can only imagine you've seen it all and been through it all. So I connected with her. I did some shows there for, for a bit. So like I'm at the point where like, I'm not really producing shows right now. I'm open to it again. Um, like one offs, they call it like once in a while or doing events but I would like to do it with more, <laughs> some more support or something like that. But um, what was I going to say? It's just been, it's just been a, a fun journey and a, and, and, and a great experience and a learning experience uh, certainly. But that's how, that's kind of like how I got into it from the independent comedy scene to doing some shows and then they're not being shows and they're being all these lockdowns and politics involved and then being like, fuck this, I'm doing my own thing. And, and it's, it is fun to book the lineups and and kind of curate uh, these these comedians. Because I really do try to, with my lineups, find people that I know are not annoying with their politics, but also diverse too, like different styles, different backgrounds, different types of people, different genders. Like I think it, there's something to be said for when you're creating a lineup, having a method to the madness where there's differences in the people, but there's like, you know, some similarities or through lines between like, you know, the comedians on there because there will be shows I'll see and there's talented people, but I can tell based on the lineup. Oh, I see. You just kind of like booked all your friends or whoever was available. You're not really you're not really curating an experience for your audience. Mm -hmm. You are by giving them comedians and that's a service in itself. But you're not, but this lineup is not really, you're not being like, oh, this is like, and I don't overtly say these are the libertarian comedians. These are the non woke comedians. I don't really frame it like that. Um, but I do definitely try to create a certain uh, experience. Like I've done lineups with like almost all women, but all like badass bitches, not like whiny ass white liberal bitches. So like that's something that I like to do or, you know, so there's this. There's different different ways you can create a diverse lineup of interesting people of different backgrounds without them being, you know, annoying. Mm -hmm. So do you have a favorite comedian or comedian and a comedian and the comedian skit that you really enjoyed while you were like producing, like when you were producing the um, show? Oh, someone's bit that I've seen live or something. Yeah. Someone's yeah. routine what? that jumps yeah. out at me. Oh, that's that's too hard to say. I mean, it, it almost like that's the type of thing that just like it just comes up in conversation like and it, and some jokes are hard they don't sound as funny there are a lot of it is like you had to be there because like just somebody a comedian's mannerisms or how they tell a joke in the context like 
if I just tell some random joke, you'd be like, dude, that's really racist and offensive. But if you see the comedian, you get to know them and you see where they're coming from, that they're like not a hateful person and they're making fun of themselves. Like that's, that's, that's always fun. I don't know. I don't, there's, I don't, I can't think of a bit that really jumps out at me off the, the top of my head. Again, I probably have to pull up a list of comedians, but I've, but like, it's been cool that I've been worked with Chrissy Mayer and, and Lila Hart and, and all the other people, Robbie, the, Robbie, the fire Bernstein was on a couple of my shows and Brian McWilliams and, and just like so many great comedians in, in town. And not all, uh, well, there are some, some of those are from out of town, but like, uh, th there's just so many great comedians out there and, and a lot of them are lesser known, but then when you go to the Instagram, it's like, oh, you have 90,000 followers. That's not zero. Maybe you don't have a Netflix special or have a Netflix special yet. And my mom doesn't know who you are, but like, like I can tell when a comedian's typically been at it three years, five years, 10 years. If a comedian's been at, I think, I feel like for me, like almost like three years is sort of like the, the magic number where I can tell like, oh, okay, you're, you're in it and you're the real deal and, and, or whatever, in terms of like pers pursuing this. The biggest way I can tell for me, like how long a comedian's uh, been at it, or even like maybe one of the main ways I judge them besides just making me laugh or liking their material is how they bounce back from when a joke doesn't work. Like, how do they handle that? Are you flustered? Are you nervous? Are you, don't make me uncomfortable just because you're, you don't, if you're uncomfortable, the audience is going to be uncomfortable. Like, like I, I love to see how comedians bounce back after something flops, like making a joke on top of their joke failure that, you know, there's ways they do that. And you could see that that's, you know, that shows the experience or lack of. Mm -hmm. So now tell me about the three most influential people in your life and how they affected you positively or negatively. Oh man, the three most influential people in my life. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I almost have to just say my mom, my dad, that's two right there. And this is going to sound like a joke and maybe even disrespectful to my sister and my grandparents and other people I'm forgetting, but it really is hard not to say Ron Paul. It It is hard not to say Ron Paul because like that man did change my entire worldview upon discovering him and his work around 2011, 2012. And changed my worldview in, in a lot of ways, not just like, oh, well, you have different politics now. It's not really, it's not, it's beyond that. It's like, he, he, he influences my, my sort of, even like personally, like I think he's an in, in inspirational beyond like, oh, I agree with his politics. Like just the way, just in, from knowing the guy and following him over the years, like he always val just like his values, like his, he values his family, he values his faith. He values his health. He values fitness. Like he's, I know he's not, he rode his bicycle for a long time. I know that's not doing that anymore. And I know he's, he struggles a little bit, even walking these days, but I'm sure he probably, you know, is still walking around the block or whatever it is. Like, just like Ron Paul, the person was, uh, is, is very important to me beyond just like Ron Paul influencing my political life. That's probably why he cracks that top three or that top three <laughs> off the, off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. So now I didn't ask you this question in the beginning. So what was one event or topic that changed your perspective of the world or on the world? I should say, I mean, right along with like the Ron Paul politics stuff. Like I just noticed that there was this politician in 2012. I don't even know how I really got into him or came across it initially. I think I just watched the Republican debates. I think I must have caught the Republican debates in 2012 or late 2011, whatever the hell it was. I've been like, wait a minute, this dude doesn't look like these other guys. He doesn't sound like the other guys. His own party is criticism, criticizing him, but all, they're also praising him. The other party is criticizing him, but some of them are praising him. What is what is going on here? Who is this person? So then I started to you know, watch some videos and read stuff. And, you know, the couple of things he would talk about off the top of my head you know the big things the military industrial complex like no one was using that term no one was thinking about that like you know how weapons defense contractors 
drive a lot of the policy and where the finances go and you know what wars happen making war happen that seemed kind of important and a earth-shattering revelation that ron paul exposed me to and the federal reserve uh where money comes from you know who controls money what is the federal reserve i mean that it's definitely a conspiracy we could take a dive deep into it into that but like i remember reading about it and be like wait a minute there's this group of people that they're independent but they act within the government but no one could really hold them accountable is that true i remember like typing this into a ron paul forum and then people were like yes that's why we're all here so that's- federal Fe- federal reserve and military industrial complex there were other things War on drugs and some other things that, but like those are the two big topics that I think were kind of earth shattering that really shifted my my outlook and and views. So now, what would it be if you could change three things about the world? Oh, change three things about the world. I mean, that's that's a pretty broad uh, broad question. Like policy or just like however you want to answer the question. Oh shit. Um. Like, this is going to sound maybe trite, but probably less hateful. Like, there probably needs to be more hate, less hate and more tolerance in the world. There really does. Like, people were, yeah, I mean, that's that's a big thing. And obviously ending the Fed and, and, and whatnot and less tax, like lowering tax. Like, there's, I mean, there's tons of policy prescriptions I can give, but like broad advice for humanity is probably not to hate and kill each other. Like, don't kill and hate each other. Like, it's not that complicated. Like, you know, a lot of libertarians, Dave Smith, Ron Paul has probably even said this too. Like, let's stop doing the worst things, like, first. Like, stop the worst things from happening, like, in our... There's a lot of bad things. We can't solve every problem and every little drama that a neighbor has with another neighbor. There's complex issues and gray areas. But we don't need to... Like, war is fucking insane. We don't need to be doing this and we don't need to be hating each other. Mm-hmm. But people profit off divisiveness and division exactly, and hatred. Mm-hmm. So now how do you handle failure or setbacks? I cry. No, I don't know. Sometimes. <laughs> we all do. How do I handle failure and setbacks? Mm-hmm. I think it's kind of what I spoke to earlier is like only giving yourself X amount of time to dwell in negativity or wallow in sadness and woe is me like some people like i don't know i think everyone feels bad for themselves at some point maybe not ron paul mm-hmm. now, question, but, you're gone. Now, questions to end the episode what is giving you hope right now what is giving me hope right now mm-hmm. i would say just connecting with more people who are not retarded, like, like broadly speaking, like connecting with good people and, and, and realizing that there are certain things we can control in our own lives and, and like focusing on that. Like if we can connect with people who are like-minded and cool people and like-minded, not necessarily political, politically, but like, I think there's a lot of good people out there and like focusing on the positive, like that's really all you can really do is focus on the positive positive. And like broadly speaking, how crazy politics have gotten and how desperate, you know, the powerful have become and how much they lie and subvert the truth. It's almost a good sign in a way that they're losing power and that their power is threatened. But I suppose we must continue to be vigilant as citizens and and do our best to to fight the power, so to speak, and uplift each other and support each other in our communities, both online and off. Maybe I should run for something. Mm -hmm. So now, what is what are three podcasts you recommend to my listeners, and why? Three podcasts I recommend. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not a good person to for this because there's so many different podcasts out there, and like I'm gonna just name political shit because that's kind of the most important thing. Although I listen to sports things, I listen to, I, I was listening to script notes for a while. Screenwriting podcast was actually very good. I'm just gonna name random ones. I don't know if I'm gonna keep it to three, but script notes is a good podcast for sure. For writing, I think it's if it's if it's not still around, I'm sure you could, arc you know access their archives. Um, I like Tom Woods' show. Part of the problem, Dave Smith. Like if you listen to 
listen to those guys, you'll probably be pretty, pretty caught up on current events broadly. And, and I don't know, I think those guys do a great job of explaining the, the philosophy in a way that's uh, digestible for the average person. And also most importantly, perhaps, or more importantly, relevant to what the fuck is going on in the world around us in the present. Mm -hmm. And now lastly, where can people find you online? Oh, where can people find me? At Adam Choit on uh, Instagram and Twitter. And on both of those pages, I have links to all my other stuff, the Tedeschi Trucks podcast, People We Love podcast, links to my film, so films and whatever the hell else I have shared. So that's probably the easiest way, it's just on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, if you're still on that and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh -huh. And you guys can follow me on uh, Twitter, Instagram, at Hockett Podcast. And you can find everything else related to my show in the link tree that's always in the show notes. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Adam, for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you.